Hello, my friend and friends. According to my analytics, most people who watch my long form content don't watch any of my shorts, and I don't want to leave you, my long form audience, to miss out on some of the best tips I've shared in short form. We're going to take a very scientific approach to finding the most valuable shorts tips I've done by looking at the shorts that have the most views. And so I'm going to cover the tips that I've done in short form here, ranked in reverse order from how many views they have, going from five to the most popular one that I've done up until now. And we're going to be starting by looking at what I called in that video the console log of CSS. And to be able to do that, you can see actually here I have some horizontal scrolling on this page, and this is primarily for when you have overflows and things that you can't find, uh, is to come in. And the one that I think most people are familiar with is doing a outline, let's just say two pixels, solid, and lime. Uh, so you can see it, and right away we can see the thing that's sticking off the side now and it's going really far. Uh, one thing I didn't share in that short, but I'm sharing with you now, is I'm doing it with my before and after. Because if it so happens to be, uh, let's just come here and just do the regular star selector instead. If you have it like this and it's on a pseudo element, it's not going to highlight it. And I purposely did it on a pseudo element right now. So uh, yeah, doing it just, you already have this selector probably for your box sizing, maybe some other stuff. Just You can just leave that comment there commented on, commented off to be able to do it. Or uh, the other thing I shared is instead of doing that, and this was in the same short, uh, was to do a background. And let's just say we do HSL, I'll do zero for red this time, we'll do 100% saturation, we'll do 50% for the lightness, so it's actually red, and then we're gonna do a low opacity. And then you can see the layering of stuff. And in this case, it's a little bit hard to see this thing because it's only two pixels tall, I think, or one pixel tall. Most of the time your overflow will probably be something a bit more obvious uh, than something small like that. Um, but it, seeing the layering of things like this can also really help sometimes because often you're trying to find the thing that's inside the thing that's inside the thing, <laughs> right? And that's why I like this tip because in the comments on that short, a lot of people said you can just use your inspect. And then when you're inspecting on it, you just take your little inspector guy and you can find the overflow. But how many times is it something that's nested like four levels deep and you have to find that exact thing and oh my goodness there it is right and so like unless you can find that exact thing which it can be hard oh i got it out here so maybe you could do that but i just find like if you don't know where it is and it's this invisible thing and you're trying to like hunt it down with this it's a nightmare you just visualize it and you're good to go so then i can come and fix this very silly problem that i did and in this case i can delete the whole thing because it was kind of useless uh, and we can keep on going with this demo and actually for this next one i'm going to move this down a little bit because you can actually see i have this favicon right here where i have demo title here uh it's kind of small uh, but the favicon is this white circle it's right there and that's great but there's an issue with favicons that are either gonna be white or dark and that's because of course i'm a developer right now and just like you you're probably setting things up in dark mode because we like living in dark spaces and and all of that and we don't like being blinded by the light mode of things and if our system settings are in dark mode that means our tabs and everything else are dark so if you have a light favicon you can see it just fine but if i come into my system settings here and i switch my system over to light mode which will take a second to kick on right there we go <laughs> uh, there it is and you can see my favicon has completely disappeared with the white tabs that are here and that's the type of thing you probably wouldn't have ever Ever thought of and so to be able to solve that I'm gonna leave it on light mode for now even though everything is kind of bothering me um, but if I come into my HTML this time actually this wasn't even a CSS tip this is an HTML tip uh, you can see I have my logo or my link rel icon here for my light one I'm gonna copy this one I'm gonna paste it down here and I have another one which is my dark logo so in this case I'm just doing a dark circle I called it white logo or I think I called it black logo actually uh, so we can set my black logo right there. And whenever we have links like this, what we can actually do is we can come on these links and we can use a media attribute, which is just basically a media query here. So I can paste that in. And in this case, this would be for my dark color scheme. I wanna be using that one. Let me just make this a bit bigger. Uh, so if we want my white logo when it prefers color scheme dark, and then we can do the opposite here, where if they prefer the color scheme light, we're gonna get the light logo. So if I hit save on that now and we go and take a look, you can see there's the little um, dark circle that's showing up where my favicon is. And if we, 
thankfully switch my mode back over to a dark mode now. With that kicking in, you can see that is switched over to a dark icon up there. And this can be really good even if you just have a toggle on your site to switch between light and dark mode, because that's going to change it for your page, but it's not going to change the tabs that are up top. And so having different options here can be really useful. And if you'd like to learn a few different ways you can do this, uh, I'll link to an article by The Joy of Code in the description where he actually looks at a few different things, including including the media query in an SVG, because we can use SVGs as uh, favicons, except it doesn't work in Safari, sadly. Um, but there's a few different options in there as well if you don't like this approach. Again, the link to that and just the joy of code, if you don't know it, is a fantastic site, so go and check it out. Now for this next one, I'm gonna bring this on over, which is the code pen I used for another one. Uh, and this short was called Number Inputs Aren't So Straightforward. And we're gonna, I'll have some on-screen graphics here to explain a few of the things that I'm going through. But you can see I have my type of text here. So this is obviously a text field that you can come in and write anything you want. It's just a regular, uh, this one here with my input type of text. Sometimes you wanna limit your users to having, you know, just being able to do numbers. And so you might use an input type number. There's a big advantage of this, which is that the keyboard will change uh, on mobile devices and they're gonna get a much better one. So just for that user experience, if you want something to be numbers that they're putting in, I would strongly suggest that you use the right input. Uh, the annoying thing with it is on desktop, you're gonna get these arrows and they always look a little bit different on each one of the different um, browsers you can get, right? And you definitely, you know, you wouldn't want someone trying to enter their credit card number this way. <laughs> but um, I could come in and I can put a number and it's going to validate that it's actually a number when you push return or, you know, if you're submitting a form and somebody put characters that aren't a number there, it's going to validate and not let them submit it, uh, which is cool. Then you'll notice here I have an input type of number and an input mode of numeric. And this will improve the keyboard even more, especially in iOS devices. I think on Android, it's actually the same um, regardless. So by putting an input type number, you will get a better keyboard. But if you have a type number and an input mode of numeric, you just get the numbers really big. It makes it super easy. So if you're just after a number without other special characters and other stuff, the input mode numeric is perfect. It's exactly what you want. You can see I have that one set up right here. Now, the problem with this is once again, we still have these stupid little arrow things <laughs> that come up on the sides here. And you could actually get rid of those arrows with some CSS, but it's a lot of CSS that you don't actually really sort of need to use anyway. <laughs> uh, because here we could use an input type of text so it doesn't get those little arrows that you want, but keep the input mode of numeric on there. And by doing that, you still get the really good keyboard on mobile devices, which is fantastic. It makes it a lot easier for the user and you don't get those little arrows that are up and down. The only problem is you might be saying, well, Kevin, I don't want someone to be able to put in letters here. So if I come up into this one and I start typing regular characters, I don't know if you can hear my keyboard or not, I'm trying to, nothing's coming in and you might feel like this is the default behavior. The browser is stopping me from putting in numbers or letters, but if I put in numbers, it's going to work. But that is actually only the case if you are using Chrome. Here, I'm gonna bring in Firefox just to show. Uh, if we come and take a look at this, input type number, I can put letters there. The only time it will say this is invalid is when I hit the submit, it's gonna go, oh, you can't do that, uh, which is handy that it does that sort of validation once you submit, but it's kind of annoying that you can write the numbers here anyway. So if you really want the best user experience, my suggestion is to do the type number, input type of numeric, and then what we can actually do is add a pattern. And when you have a pattern like this, we're getting the same validation that you'd have in an input type number anyway. This is just using regex. You can do all sorts of stuff here. Uh, so we're basically just saying that it's any numbers from zero to nine. This does mean in this case, I'm not gonna allow like 8.55 or anything like that. So if you do wanna have decimals or other things, you would have to make a little bit more robust of a regex pattern right here. But for now, I'm only going to accept characters zero through nine. Um, so we're only taking all the numbers. You can put as many numbers as you want. And you'd be doing this on your input type number here anyway. So you'd probably just wanna come in with a little bit of JavaScript here. And what this JavaScript is doing, I'm not gonna go through it all right now, but what this is doing is if I come in this, even though it's a type of input, it's using the pattern and it's only going to allow me to enter valid characters. So you can see I'm, or not see, but maybe you can hear, I'm typing, nothing's working, but if I come and start putting numbers, it's working. If I start putting letters, it's not working again. So this gives you sort of the best of both worlds because it's an input and inputs are annoying <laughs> in general, right? And so yeah, input, 
type text, input mode numeric, so you get the good keyboard, and then the pattern here, which is going to work for like client side validation. You wanna validate everything server side probably, uh, but it'll work just to prevent the form from even going if there's anything but numbers, and then a little bit of extra JavaScript to prevent other characters from actually being written in by a user, you know, cause somebody is going to come in and write like seven, the word, cause people, right? Uh, so there we go. Input type numeric was the tip number three. We're getting close to the top. Uh, and we're gonna jump back to the other demo now, which was this one right here. And what I wanna look at for this one is something that actually has been my second most popular short. Uh, and I think it's because it made people really angry. <laughs> the comments in that one are very mixed. And I called it modern CSS is magic. It took off right away and it took off with lots of people being really angry. <laughs> so here I have my div class of wrapper where I'm just wrapping my page. I used to call these containers. I don't anymore because we now have container queries and I use dot container to be a utility class for myself uh, for those types of things. So uh, I'm just calling it wrapper, but you can call it wrapper, you can call it container, whatever you want. And what I did for this one, let's go find it, uh, dot wrapper. I exaggerating a little bit here on how we might set up a wrapper and let's put an outline on here just so we can see it. Uh, solid red. There we go. There's my wrapper. And there's a couple of things that we do wrappers for, right? First is setting a max width so our content can't get too wide. And then we'll do a margin left and right auto. Uh, I would say instead of that these days, part of this could just be a margin inline instead of auto, which is effectively the same thing. It's our inline axis. So I'm only putting the auto on the left and right. I much prefer this than a zero auto, just in case, you know, shorthands are always dangerous and maybe you have a utility class on one of your pages where you need to add margin on the top or the bottom. And then it's running into conflict with this one. And depending on how you set things up, the wrong one might win. So doing only exactly what you need is always beneficial. So I guess we could come here and do the same thing, padding inline of auto. So a little bit of improvement there, uh, not auto, <laughs> to rem. A little bit of improvement there. Uh, so we're keeping that max width still. Let's turn on my uh, dev tools here just for a second so I can shrink this down. And the reason I put that padding there is to keep the space here when we're at smaller screens. So if we're smaller than 50 rem, I wanna have that, that spacing on the left and the right. And this works really well. There is one problem is if you're taking an exact value, like say you have a Figma file and you come in and my Figma file is 926 pixels because designers like doing stuff like that. <laughs> um, and then, so that, that's going to work, but your content's actually narrower than that, right? Because you have the 926, but then you have this padding that's coming in there and you have your box sizing border box like we already looked at. So this is 926 up until the red line and then the padding's making the content a little bit narrower. So what I looked at as an alternative here is instead of doing a max width is using a width and then using the min function. And so you can say the min is 926 or 100% uh, and it's gonna choose whichever one is smaller between those two, uh, which is kind of cool. And you can see it looks exactly the same. Right now we've accomplished literally the exact same thing that we just had uh, with the max width that was on there. So it's gonna work exactly the same way. But then what we can do is actually remove our padding from here and say that we have a 100% minus two rem and hit save. And now it's almost exactly the same. Uh, it's gonna work at the larger sizes, but as this shrinks down, you can see that when we're doing that, we have the space here and the space there. And actually in this case, if I wanna match closer to what I had before, I would do a four because we want two on each side. Uh, you don't need to put a calc here. People often ask me this. So we don't need to do a calc in here. The reason we don't need to do a calc is because we're in a min function. If you're in a min, a max, a clamp, um, and a lot of the newer math related functions that we have in CSS now, you don't need to include calcs inside of them. And I'm doing four rem because before I had two rem on the left, two rem on the what right. So now this is working the same way, but with the advantage of the content actually matching this number that I put here. Now, one of the things that people said <laughs> in this is if you, came across this, a, you know, junior developer does this in the code, it might not pass code review. Uh, people will come across this if it is in the code and they're just gonna get a strange look or something like that because it's not the most readable thing in the world, just because it's an unfamiliar pattern. I still think it's a better pattern because the content actually matches the size that I wanted. Uh, and I actually talked about this at CSS Day where I think unfamiliar patterns don't mean they're bad, they're just something we haven't gotten used to. 
And in this case, it is a marginal improvement, but I think it's a really good way to start pushing the right way. And you can make it so much more readable. You just say that the max width is 926. And then I can come here and then I can do a var max width and it's going to work exactly the same way. My outline disappeared because uh, I removed it, but it's gonna work the same way. It's very clear what's happening. I could even come in and say this is padding. So my wrapper's padding is, we said two rem, and that way people know that it's gonna be two rem. I guess you'd assume it would be two rem on the two sides. So then here we could actually just do my var padding times two. Um, we do use order of operations here, but just to be safe, we could wrap that as well in a set of parentheses, just so it does this math before it does the 100% minus. Uh, and that should be working. Actually, we probably call this wrapper padding and then wrapper max width, just to be safe, because you could have other custom properties doing similar things. So let's improve that a little bit there with my wrapper on both of them. Um, and yeah, that works really well. And the advantage of this, in my opinion, is first of all, uh, it might look weird down here, but this is like the don't touch zone. This is the stuff that someone would come in and modify, but then you could also come in and do like a wrapper, you know, XL. And then you're just saying wrapper max width is now, I don't know, 1600 pixels or something. And you're not having to redefine your width. You're not coming in with a new max width. It's super easy to understand what's happening. Um, it's a very minor improvement, but I also think it gets us working in a smarter way using custom properties and using modern CSS, which is only a good thing. And it just sort of helps us break into new patterns and new other things along the way. So just a little something to think about. You might hate this, you might love it. Let me know in the comments below if you think this is over-engineered or not. <laughs> um, if you do, I'd actually encourage you to go watch my CSS Day Talk. I'll put that the link to that in the description as well, because I talk a little bit about the idea of why it's actually maybe a good thing to over-engineer your CSS. But that was just the second top tip that I had. The top tip I had was actually not specifically about like some lines of code, surprisingly enough. It's a video that just continues to do really well. And it's called Don't Learn Web Dev This Way. And what I talk about in that video is the mistake that I see a lot of people making. And this, people come on my Discord and they'll be asking questions. I get emails from people all the time telling me what they've been doing and being really frustrated that they're not improving as much as they think they should. And the couple of things that come up is first of all, it takes a long time to get good at anything you're doing. So it's completely fine. If you're just getting started, expect the progress to be, it's fits and starts. You'll feel like you're making a lot of progress. You'll get a little bit stuck and then it's just the way things go when you learn anything. But the main tip that I was sharing in that video was to get past tutorial hell, which is when people follow lots of tutorials, they feel like they know what they're doing. And then when they go to code, they just don't know what to do and, or how to do it independently. And it's just that we can't learn by following tutorials, whether that's watching videos like I do here on YouTube or reading articles or whatever it is, whatever medium you're using, it doesn't really matter that if you're just following a tutorial exactly through every time, you're not learning enough. And I like to use the skateboard analogy uh, for this, where you could watch hundreds of hours of videos on skateboarding, or you could go to the skate park and you could watch people skating even, and you could understand a lot of what's going on, right? You could see the foot movements they're using. You could even look at like how they're doing a kick flip and be trying to figure it out and seeing how they're doing it or just an ollie, I guess would be a lot easier, but whatever, it doesn't matter. You can watch people skateboard forever. You can watch tutorials on how to skateboard forever. The first time you step on a skateboard, you're more likely to fall on your butt than you are to actually be able to do anything whatsoever because by watching all of these things and knowing what to do is very different from being able to do that. And it sounds different when it's code versus like a physical activity because with physical stuff, you have to learn the movements and you know understand the balance. And there's a lot more on that front that you're doing, but it's actually very similar no matter what you're doing. Cause it might feel like I can read code and understand it. I should be able to write that same code, but it's actually basically just as big of a departure from being able to do a physical activity uh, understanding what that person's doing versus being able to do it is very similar to looking at something and understanding it versus being able to write it yourself. So what's the trick is <laughs> to build stuff yourself and get stuck along the way. Cause when you get stuck, that's how you're going to learn new things. So instead of relying on tutorials to bring you through step one, step two, step three, step four, you start on your own, then you get stuck and then you go find a tutorial and you see how to fix it. You don't copy and paste anything. You don't follow along. You watch it, you get the solution, you put the solution away, and then you try and remember how to do exactly what they just showed. And if you are following tutorials, there's nothing wrong in them. I do a lot of them for a reason, because I do think you can learn a lot from them. 
even if you're following along with a tutorial, there's sort of two different approaches. One of them can just be general awareness of something. You're watching all these tips today. You're probably not gonna remember exactly how to do all of those different things I've been talking about. But what you might remember is that those things are possible, right? You're gonna do a number input at one point and you may be like, oh, I know these are tricky because of something I watched seven months ago. I don't remember what it was, but there's a few things with this. I should probably look it up first and you'll be able to find it a little bit faster. Or you might be trying to do something with your favicon and you completely forget how to do it, but you know that there's a way to actually change it between light and dark mode, and that makes it really easy to find after. So you might just be doing tutorials for that, and that's completely fine. I watch lots of videos just to raise my awareness of things and know what's actually possible. But if you're trying to follow a tutorial to learn how to do something, whether it's a course, whether it's a free video you're watching, or a free article, or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. If you have code in front of you, first of all, be writing all the lines of code, but try and still be doing as much independently as possible. See if you can pull ahead of the tutorial or pause the tutorial after they do something. Don't code along with them. See them do it, pause, then do uh, like a bulk of it in from memory as much as possible. When you get stuck, then you rewind a little bit. You go, oh, I, f I made a typo here. Or I forgot what that word was or something like that. It doesn't matter. But the more independent work you can do, the better. And one tip that I don't think many people actually do, but can really, really help out is if you do follow along with a tutorial, when you're done, like immediately when you finish, rebuild that same thing again. And this is obviously not for like a full website, but if you're doing something smaller, uh, or you could do it with a full website, I guess, but <laughs> the longer the project, the less likely it is that you'll do it. But rebuild that exact same thing now without the tutorial. You have some of the memory of doing it and you're still gonna get stuck, I guarantee it. You're gonna get stuck a whole bunch of times and it's super frustrating because you just did it. But those are the types of things that can help reinforce everything that you're learning and you're gonna make a lot more progress. And one last tip that was not in a short, I haven't done a short about this, though I am planning one, but I did do a long form content video actually on this, which is this line of code that's right here. Interpolate size allow keywords. You might've noticed it when I was going, thought maybe Kevin's gonna mention it, so I saved it for now, which you can throw this exact selector in your CSS file right at the top in your root selector like you can see and suddenly you're going to be able to animate to and from height or width auto and some other keywords as well and it just works as long as you're in Chrome but it should be coming to the other browsers eventually too it's a really nice progressive enhancement uh, so honestly just take it do it now it's amazing and while I haven't talked about that one in a short I did do that one in a long form video uh, it's only about five minutes long though. If you're interested in that one, it is right here for your viewing pleasure. And with that, I would like to thank my enablers of awesome, Andrew, Philip, Simon, and Tim, as well as all my other patrons and all of my channel members here on YouTube for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more awesome.